Ronald Reagan. Sweet, sweet 80s haircuts. 21 kiloton branding. Commies. Grenade spam. Political correctness. Artificial intelligence. Space monkeys. Creepy gas masks. Welcome to Call of Duty Black Ops Cold War. You kill commies and love Ronald Reagan. Trigger warning. As anyone familiar with my channel is aware, I am a world champion Call of Duty player. I am literally one of the best people in the world at playing this game terribly, horribly badly. This is all important for two reasons. Firstly, experienced players watching me in multiplayer might end up doing a little bit of sick up in their mouths. And it's also important for reasons that I will qualify later. I am also the winner of the 2018 Nobel Prize for camping in video games. I don't do it deliberately, it's just my little legs get oh so tired, so I end up needing a little lay down, preferably in a choke point with an LMG, laying on a proximity mine whilst eating a sandwich. Forgive me. So what is Call of Duty? Black Ops Cold War. Well, it's a game with too many words in the fucking title, that's a fact. It's also Activision's 2020 iteration of Call of Duty, the now world famous video game, where you hammer through the variable quality short campaign out of habit before playing hundreds of hours of online multiplayer because you enjoy being vexed, frustrated, angry and infuriated by 11 year olds who destroy you repeatedly. You play for hours to unlock all the attachments on a gun and when the gun is finally perfect you drop it on the ground, pick up a worse gun with zero attachments and then repeat the miserable and frustrating process all over again. This year's offering differs from normal. Usually Activision rotates production between several studios, but this year it all went tits up and production fell on its ass. Apparently Sledgehammer Games and Raven Software were squabbling a lot, so Bobby Kotick reached down with his iron fist from the eagle's nest and put Treyarch in charge and they would do the multiplayer part and Raven Software would develop this single player campaign. Actually. I doubt Bobby Kotick even knows what a fucking video game is at this point, let alone what Call of Duty is. He probably spent all year counting his money, fighting off shareholder revolt and arranging his retirement to Beijing. The end result of all this inter-studio politics and fuckery is a slightly confused, vaguely directionless, certainly underpolished video game, which a lot of people are grumbling about. The campaign has received a lacklustre response, the multiplayer is a bit of an unbalanced mess and everyone is trying to claim the disruption to the workflow process was caused by that virus. You know the one, the one that absolutely definitely did not come from that biosafety level 4 bioweapons lab just down the road from ground zero of the outbreak where several of the scientists have disappeared and they won't let international observers visit even though it was a condition of helping them set it up. That bioweapons lab. Yeah, it absolutely did not come from the Wuhan bioweapons lab. <coughs> and get used to this by the way, until the current global situation is resolved, every video game publisher will blame the virus for all and every failing. Everyone's working from home, so they don't have to travel anymore Everyone can work in their favourite comfy chairs, 
without distraction. Everybody can avoid office politics and gossip and crack on with the job. Pornhub traffic has broken all previous records. Yet somehow, video game publishers are fucking shit up and blaming all of this for their failings. Get used to it. The game very notably released with a controversial but highly interesting trailer referencing the KGB defector Yuri Bezmenev. He was a Russian defector during the Cold War who told the West all about active measures. This was a Soviet psyops propaganda technology that he claimed was being used to destabilise the West by disintegrating the normal bonds of social cohesion, sowing chaos and turning the state against itself. I cannot say with certainty if active measures are being used on the West right now because shockingly I am not a social policy professor, a CIA analyst or James fucking Bond. I would however note that traditionally in America's history it's usually been the ignorant white racists smashing up businesses owned and run by African Americans. Recently I have seen a scary amount of news footage of African American political activists smashing the shit out of and burning down businesses owned and run by other African Americans and the white folk that are being encouraged by them to assist them in this process are claiming to be fighting for their civil rights. So yeah, when Yuri Bezmenev claims that the Soviet Union has a long term plan to disintegrate the normal bonds of social cohesion so chaos and turn the state against itself, well that certainly makes a lot of the current insanity and injustice going on seem slightly more contrived and comprehensible. Just saying. I strongly advise you to watch a few videos or do some reading on active measures because it sure as shit will make some of today's craziness make a little more sense in context. As a footnote, the since brushed away trailer also contained a one second clip of the Tiananmen Square massacre. Structure. 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 So the game was immediately banned in China. As a matter of fact, under Article 38 of China's new anti dissension law, it's now a criminal offence to say or do subversive stuff of any nature that undermines Chinese state rule anywhere in the world. Just expressing support for an independent Hong Kong like Blitz Chung did is a crime. Good lad. Or showing clips of the Tiananmen Square massacre is a crime. Like this one. Seriously injured were brought for emergency surgery. Two were already dead. And this one. And they can issue extradition orders on you and try and drag your ass to China for a thorough beating. So I guess I'd better be careful what I say or I might end up like these poor bastards from the Tiananmen Square massacre. The atmosphere and context of the 1980s is central to the campaign's narrative. So here is the 1980s summed up in a few sentences. It was the Cold War. Almost immediately as the dust had settled on World War II, the West and the Soviet Union both came to the quick conclusion that despite fighting on the same side, they were both now each other's biggest potential threat. Two vast empires basically jockeyed for power and influence with neither of them really wanting to trigger a full scale conflict. During the post war years the West and the Soviet Union faced off against each other. Everyone had huge armies and a fuck bucket of nuclear weapons. Everyone grew up fearing that any second somebody in some bunker silo somewhere would get drunk on vodka or high on weed and press the big red button plunging us into total nuclear annihilation. It was a very very real threat that loomed over the world. Simultaneously it was a time of economic renewal in the west and a time for drinking aviation antifreeze to get slammed for Russian troops in Afghanistan. 80s music was awesome. 80s fashion was a beautiful kaleidoscopic train wreck. John Hughes movies were firing into cinemas faster than you could say weird science. 
kids savoured their teenage angst because they knew one day they would grow up and things would be better. Aside from the ever-present fear of dying horribly in nuclear fire, the 80s were also a time of optimism, hope and the natural assumption that tomorrow would be better than today and the day after tomorrow would be even better than that. The future was going to be wonderful. All we needed to do was get there. Obviously, the future turned out to be a shithole. Kids are now routinely poorer than their parents. Most of the world's money and wealth has been sucked into the pockets of a few thousand evil fucktards who live in tax havens or on private super yachts. Our so-called democracy has degenerated into a choice between which corrupt idiot we choose to steal the country's wealth. The global economy is in freefall. There is a fucking pandemic and the ice caps are melting. You can, however, still get John Hughes movies, so I guess it all wasn't for nothing. So let's discuss the functionality and fuckery in this game. Well, right off the bat, delaying the full horror of the macro transactions until December ain't gonna fool anyone. This is now the industry standard operating procedure to avoid bad press at launch. It works something like this. Distribute pre-release copies covered by non-disclosure agreements one to three weeks prior to launch. Give these to shills, people who are contracted to promote the game, or just young, eager, innocent YouTubers who will set aside their objectivity for the sake of channel growth. Oh yeah, and news review sites you have big advertising contracts with. Let them release their reviews prior to launch and before the microtransactions have started. Most of these reviews will be, uh, at the very least, 7 out of 10. <coughs> because, well, you get what you pay for. Launch the game, let the other peon channels do their reviews. You have already won the PR war, mind. And then, when the units have shifted, without controversy and to a fanfare of applause, start shitting microtransactions down everyone's throats. Like your life depends on it. Make no mistake, judging from the last game, Activision's army of psychologists, casino operators and gambling specialists will finally hone a system using manipulated, matchmaking, precision frustration tactics and self-learning algorithmic AI to squeeze every last dollar they can out of you. Or make the game miserable and slow progress if you don't bite. I have predicted this, and so it will be thus. This game has heavy duty lobby manipulation and performance based matchmaking and this is pissing off a lot of players. Taking too long grinding out that free gun in the season pass? Don't worry, Activision's painted fuck you in the arse technology will put you in endless shitty lobbies teamed up with jizz mops until such time as you just say fuck it and pay for a few boosts. Personally, I always snigger when I see the message balancing the teams. I always imagine the AI is trying to work out who the second biggest camping fuck is in the lobby so it can put them in the other team facing off against me. All this aside, the performance-based matchmaking is really getting on people's tits. Basically, it punishes excellence and rewards failure. If you're a brilliant player, you will routinely be thrown into lobbies with other brilliant players and get stomped. The better you play, the more you get stacked against harder opponents. Obviously, this is not a problem I face. It's fucking great for arsed hards like me, but for proper players, well, they get dicked. I would also note that progression seems a bit slow this time round. It seems to take ages to grind out a weapon at the moment. The forced diversity that is being pushed onto the franchise is as hypocritical as it is ridiculous and incoherent. I mean, you can choose to be a non-binary CIA agent, but it's literally just a box you tick on the form. It has no impact on the game whatsoever. This is literally, and I mean quite very literally, an exercise in box ticking. It's faux virtue signalling that insults both the players and the trans community and wherever those two groups overlap. There was a diversity statement pop up at one point in the game, 
something about having a positive and inclusive environment and avoiding toxicity. It's tokenism of the highest order. Perhaps they're just shit scared of the outrage brigade and the professionally offended, but it infuriates me that video game companies are now grovelling at the feet of the likes of Reset Era and Anita fucking Sarkeesian and other fucking cream puff scum lords who don't really care about video games. They're into politics. Seriously, this isn't some official government educational tool made with taxpayers' money. It's a video game, which I bought with my cash, and I don't require any political re-education to come with it. Thank you very much. Look, commercial IPs are under no legal requirement to comply with the whim and titter of any specific political agenda and agree to impose that on its customers. This is not a public service broadcast, this is a private entertainment product. Besides, this is also Activision, who shits on its staff, sells out its esports players to the People's Republic of China, and is currently under investigation for its links to the Chinese government and gambling in its video games. Allegedly. Throwing a little message into the start of a game, telling everyone you encourage positivity and diversity, is frankly a joke. Especially if you are an ethnic erger, playing this game just after getting out of your Chinese gulag. Oh yeah, the social credit system means you won't be able to afford an Xbox, so I guess you won't see this game anyway. The long and short of it was that despite being a game about the CIA and the Russian KGB, the diversity profiles of the default players resulted in some absurdly fucking improbable outcomes in the early days whilst everyone was still playing with default characters. At one point, I was loading into a map where I think the CIA was fighting Spetsnats in Miami, and my entire team was made up of what looked like identical Colombians wearing jaunty little red neckerchiefs. Another time, my entire team was a force of identical East African female terrorists wearing headscarves. I know I'm at risk of sounding very old fashioned here, but would it be incredibly rude to get a couple of default playable characters that actually look like, well, you know, 1980s American and Russian soldiers? Those are usually the guys populating CIA and Spetsnaz combat operations in the 1980s. I've got nothing against Columbia or headscarves, but I did pay for this fucking war game, so any chance I could get a soldier to play with? Now, I do not pretend to be an expert on 1980s military history, but I have personally never heard any rumours that the Spetsnaz combat missions were entirely staffed by Colombians. All I will say is this, the game is so painfully politically correct that after playing the game for days, I had still not unlocked a character from my own ethnic group. And by my own ethnic group, I obviously mean old fat lazy geezer that wheezes a lot when he runs. The crushingly long loading screens and loading out screens are now fucking huge. Just trying to select a new weapon skin accesses some remote server in Castle Activision's dungeon, so sometimes just painting my gun pink causes the game to lag for 5 to 10 seconds. As this is a live service game, with a fuck ton of skins, content, cosmetics and psychometric data being shunted up and down the pipe, the game frequently hangs, whilst the game either downloads the new cosmetic moustaches for your female soldiers or uploads your personal data for analysis. So the PsyOps division at Activision can calculate precisely how to fuck you up and frustrate you so you are ripe for exploitation when the microtransactions arrive. There were some significant polish issues at launch. I thought this was more of a shame than a disgrace really, because for all of its many faults, Call of Duty is at least a franchise that usually releases working properly. Often working very well by today's low standards. Chat wasn't working at launch. There are key binding issues, I see text boxes overwriting each other in the corner of the screen. Zombies is apparently disconnecting everybody. The sound mix was balked. I will qualify that the audio in the game itself is cracking. 
The guns sound meaty. They have tweaked the thwacking and hacking noises so you can get much more feedback on hits and kills. It's all a bit hammy and over the top, but very, very satisfying and well done. My beast is specifically with the sound mix and relative volumes. However I mixed it, played with the sound settings or the audio settings on my PC, I could not stop certain gun noises from spiking way above the rest of the audio. Playing late at night, this was a pain in the cock. I either had to play at a volume where everything was barely audible and the gunplay sounded normal, or suffer the huge dynamic range issues by playing at a comfortable volume where every 30 seconds the gunplay would practically pop my speakers, scare the local cat and fox population into the headlights of oncoming cars, and blow out a window or two. They need to introduce specific sliders for things like gunshots, just like other games do. Or you know, just mix the audio properly. The issue of cheating obviously has to be raised. There is no escape in the fact that some players are already cheating like fuck. The anti-cheat police posted a video on Twitter to show kids are not only cheating, but they are basically normalising and promoting it on TikTok. You know TikTok, that shitty social media platform that gives all your data to the People's Republic of China and quietly censors videos about disability, homosexuality, trans issues and Hong Kong independence. I was part of a joyous match where some snap shooting, one shot, headshot sniper on the other team merrily gallivanted around like Lady fucking Godiva crossed with a world class football player. But off this fucker went, skipping around the map, one-shotting everybody, whilst bouncing my flashbangs and grenades off his fucking head, and every kill cam, he was entirely unfazed by the blasts, blinding flashes, and the hail of bullets coming his way. I'm sure Activision will chalk this down to latency, but I played COD for years on a shit PC with shit internet, and despite my terrible memory, I don't recall one-shotting the whole of the enemy team twice per minute because I had a bitter latency. There is a lot of cheating, mostly you won't notice because Activision is cunningly introducing lots of perks that conveniently map across a lot of visually identifiable hacks. Yeah, I said it. But sometimes you will ult 4 out of a match because you can barely spawn without being one-shotted across the map 14 times in a row. Common hacks like remove flinch, immunity to flashbang and stun, seeing players through walls, they are conveniently aligned with perks these days. And I can only assume it's to win the psychological war so that honest players have a reason to chalk it up to something other than video game publishers don't give a fuck if your experience is wrecked by cheaters. Because fixing that problem costs money. I would also like to discuss the single most disgraceful thing that Treyarch did with this game, which personally I find absolutely abhorrent and unforgivable. They have removed claymores. This was a disgusting and cynical move and severely impeded my camping opportunities. And no, having a proximity mine instead is in no way a decent substitute. Please bring back my favourite skill trap. I will even trade in my rifle for some claymores. Fuck knows I get more kills with them. So, what about the campaign? I don't really want to go too deeply or specifically into the single player campaign because it could spoil it. So if this sounds a bit like a random string of factoids and observations completely out of context, well that's basically because it is. If I give you too much info, it will blow it. Like reading a review of The Sixth Sense, which describes it as that movie about the dude that doesn't realise he's dead. There's no point watching the movie after that, really. So here are my random observations about the campaign. Well, it's okay. Traditionally, Call of Duty campaigns are highly linear, no-brainer affairs which run on rails with fairly defined goals which you get right or you get told to start the section again. This campaign, whilst being a bit of a mess, is actually better than that. I personally thought Call of Duty Modern Warfare from last year had a reasonable campaign, but I would say it's probably more style than substance. This year, it's more substance than style. It's a bit befuddled, 
and reminds me, frankly, of an 80s spy thriller. But it's okay. Not gonna lie, it was almost cathartic to hear someone use the phrase commie bastard as a pejorative after all these years of political correctness. Oh god, I bet calling someone a bastard is going to get people cancelled nowadays because you're berating them for being paternally challenged and criticising them for innate qualities that they can't change. I'm going to have to call it and say the campaign went a little woke. As I stated, you can now be a non-binary CIA agent from the 80s in legal documented form only, of course. This is frankly awfully jarring, both thematically and morally. Fucking hysterical considering that one of the missions was basically straight out of Apocalypse Now. You quite unironically strafe every single straw hat wearing villager in a Vietnamese village and then do the same along several miles of countryside. If I had been asked to shoot up a group of fleeing women and children, it would have slotted right in there without breaking a sweat. It was literally channeling the days of Rambo. If it's wearing a straw hat, it's the enemy. I'm talking that level of kill them all and let God sort them out. I'm not complaining by the way, it was fucking brilliant, using a Huey mounted minigun to hose down commies in rice paddies, the smell of cordite, brains and scorched straw hat filling my nostrils is quite literally my idea of heaven. I merely bring it up because thematically it was somewhat at odds with the flippant statements about inclusivity. I mean, come on. This game is like a drill instructor walking into the barracks and saying, hey guys, we're really inclusive and diverse here in the Marines and we won't tolerate toxicity. So grab your gear and jump in the chopper. We're gonna shoot ourselves some sandal jockeys. Let's just say the campaign stinks of hypocrite. The weaponry is a bit on the piss too. I mean, they can't even get a fucking K-bar right for fuck's sake. And instead, it had some kind of stunted abomination of a knife, artistically modelled in the general theme of a K-bar, but clearly modelled by someone more used to painting rather than bushcraft. It was a stubby little mutant variant. I swear this must be a deliberate fuck you to servicemen and women, deliberately fucking up the most iconic knife ever to see military service over nearly a century. I watched an interesting video with a weapons historian pointing out the good and the bad. Mostly he spoke with praise about the game's arsenal, but notably winced at the Beretta 92S showing up in Russia using a fucky Chinese assault rifle as a sniper tool, a fictional drama magazine for the AK-74U and the completely ridiculous preponderance of red dot and holographic optics slapped onto nearly every gun. I'm going to pretend I care out of a sense of professional duty, but honestly, even as an internet keyboard warrior gun expert who argues with people on the internet about this shit, I didn't really mind. Call of Duty is still at the top of the league when it comes to gun fuckery and trying to at least stay relatively close to reality as far as the gun models are concerned at least. So they're going to get a pass from me given the level of gun nonsense in 2020. I would note however that some of the guns have silly names. I was literally about to run my mouth off about the Uzi being called the Milano and then discovered that it is indeed the Sachimi Type 821 made by Milano. So on this occasion I will consider myself schooled and shut the fuck up about the naming convention disparities which I had assumed was a licensing issue. If this upsets you perhaps you have time to research all the guns on the interwebs where I am confident that after midnight you will find lots of people to argue with about it until the early hours of the morning. The inclusion of the Stoner LMG shows that the devs are at least watching the YouTube channel Forgotten Weapons even though it's clearly evident that they don't fucking understand a single thing that Ian is saying. But the stoner was an iconic weapon of the Vietnam era, favoured by special ops forces, so its inclusion is a nice touch. There were also all kinds of anachronistic fuckeries going on in the game, caused by either 
bad research, lack of finished weapons at launch or some combination of both. Despite being set in the 80s, the TV shop had a combination of 80s and 60s and 70s TVs. East German Stasi were using MP5 submachine guns, despite that being a West German weapon. It was all a bit on the cock and cobbled together. The brainwashing part was funny and based on real science, although in real life the results were slightly less spectacular. You see, the CIA discovered that you could indeed brainwash someone. This part is true. By giving test subjects insanely large amounts of LSD and other profoundly unsafe psychotropic drugs constantly and for over a year, you could eventually turn your test subject slash torture victim into a functionally useless person with no memories. To be fair, they didn't really achieve anything that you couldn't do with a claw hammer, completely fucking up someone's brain and capacity to access memories isn't really the holy grail of Psy Ops and MK Ultra. That's what assassination is for, but I guess it kept a lot of sadistic psychiatrists in well paid jobs for a decade or so, so it's not a complete loss. Well, not a complete loss for the mad scientist community at least. There is a persistent urban myth that during the Cold War the KGB and the CIA developed brainwashing technology that allowed them to totally overwrite the human brain and effectively reprogram them like a computer. At the time, computers were the new hot technology, and generally speaking everyone thought the brain was a computer, just a very very sophisticated and complicated one. The urban myth is propped up by several famous accounts where people were apparently brainwashed when really they were just persuaded or manipulated to change sides. These two things are absolutely not equivalent. Manipulating, persuading and convincing people to accept a new reality is an entirely social and psychological practice that has been around since the first humans decided to take sides in a dispute. As long as cognitive dissonance is a thing, people can exert pressure on people to flip to the enemy cause. If you can make people question their reality, you can flip them to work for you. That's where double agents come from, and they are older than the Roman Empire. Giving people psychoactive drugs and flashing weird pictures in their eyes like Clockwork Orange might be good for aversion therapy, but it won't literally mind wipe someone and covertly turn them into some kind of CIA super soldier sleeper agent. That's some serious bullshit. I'm sorry, but if you are entertaining the fantasy that you are the next Jason Bourne just waiting to be activated, I'm sorry to break the sad news to you, but you probably are just a plain old boring microtransaction coder, or even fucking worse a video game community manager. Look, if you stick someone in a lab for a year, pump them full of fucking LSD and hal paradol and give them electric shocks and nausea drugs while showing them Ronald Reagan speeches, they're just going to get fucking confused. And if it's late period Reagan speeches, you probably won't even need the drugs for that. Sure, the association of electrical shocks will result in the person developing a disliking of Ronald Reagan speeches because they associate it with pain, being drugged off their tits and terrified. It's unlikely to stop them being a Reaganite. All you will achieve is making people feel sick and freaked out at Reagan speeches. And even that effect is unlikely to persist for more than a few months. You ain't gonna fill them with the urge to change their name to Boris, join the Communist Party and start fixing tractor parts in Vladivostok. My point is that the core premise of the entire campaign, the ability to drug someone into thinking they are some completely different person with different memories, is shady at best. Sure, you can drug the shit out of someone and abuse them until they spill their guts and tell you secret spy stuff, but you can achieve this with persuasion and sometimes just the threat of torture. Normally just locking someone up for six months in a cold shitty prison is enough. You can even drug people with psychotropics and bombard them with sensory overload until their memories are pretty much destroyed. There's also a big difference between erasing all of the information on a hard drive 
and smashing the hard drive with our fucking hammer. The main point here is that I am not convinced that you can put some dude in a room, drug them and convince them that they are an entirely different person with a different personal history fighting on the enemy side who just fucking incidentally speaks a different language. That's a pretty big reach. Great fodder for sci-fi and thrillers though, I'll give them that. The new lock picking mechanics are top shelf gear. Seriously, it was a fucking boon to see a new attempt to handle lock picking in game, which at least tried somewhat to mimic actual lock picking. Nearly all video games use the tried and tested Fallout slash Skyrim method or something different, but not exactly scientific like Kingdom Come Deliverance. Call of Duty basically tried to imitate real lock picking whilst removing one parameter which was arse because real lock picking is about maintaining rotational tension while reaming the pins. Nevertheless, I really like this flourish. I've not seen it in any video game before. In fact, it looks like a very simplified unidimensional lock picking tutorial. Obviously, I should qualify that I know nothing about lock picking because it's very, very naughty indeed. And I obviously do not have several sets of dummy training locks and three different sets of lock picks sitting on my desk right now. But theoretically, if I did, I would note that this new lock picking mechanism, whilst being horribly, horribly oversimplified, is probably the future of video game lock picking mechanics. And I reckon people can handle the increased complexity of making it more realistic. Perhaps it is more complex on higher difficulty settings. The average gamer has probably watched 20 videos on lock picking because they have a problem solving mentality so they can handle it. Well played Treyarch. This mechanic with associated visuals is the beginning of a beautiful friendship. Game mechanics wise at least. However, the audio dialogue in the game is frequently balked. Not kidding, your buddy Woods shouts out random catchphrases like an asynchronous orgy of mistimed 80s tropes and cliches. I swear, that twat shouts, cover me, move up, or whatever else the fuck he kept saying. So often he made Arnold Schwarzenegger's worst movie sound like fucking French romantic prose. Then again, I always thought about Arnie that way anyway. He's an unrecognised poet. Guys, seriously, I'm waiting for the Arnold Schwarzenegger book of philosophical quotes to come out at Christmas. The voice acting was perfectly fine, but the way some of the shouts were looped made some of the guys in some situations sound like they were teretic and today's tick was shouting random shit like, I need covering fire. You shouldn't have fucked with us. It's your funeral and they do it over and over again. Great voice actors, badly utilised. Maybe record more lines of dialogue next time. Go on, push the boat out, pay for that extra day in the recording studio. I mean, you can theoretically afford that, even if you don't like to spend that. Structuring the campaign missions around an investigation process is a nice idea, but honestly, it didn't hook me. I think probably because I signed up for Rambo and not Miss Marple. It's highly likely that if I was a little more patient and a lot more intelligent, I would have got much more out of it. But honestly, I don't really give that much of a fuck about solving the puzzles or mysteries. I found myself just briefly scanning the evidence and then pressing whatever buttons let me start the next lot of shooting. And maybe that's an issue here. Maybe the campaign lasts much longer if you spend hours staring at the mission board, desperately trying to work out the subtle nuances of the spy mystery going on here. A mystery about which I personally gave not one fuck about. I bought Call of Duty for shooting and violence, not thinking and problem solving. This is perhaps a personal failure of mine, but there it is nevertheless. I guess Call of Duty is a game where puzzles are fine, but you point the car forward and drive in one direction. You only look as far as the end of your bonnet and you don't bother looking to the end of the road. Puzzles are things you solve as you meet them in game, then you move on through the mission. Job done. 
in this Call of Duty campaign rather than present puzzles in situ to solve as you encounter them in real time, the evidence board mechanics create long-term conundrum to resolve which introduces an element of strategy, completionism and problem solving that I personally didn't sign up for. Put it this way, I was pretty pissed off when I found out that apparently, fairly early on, I'd spunked my opportunity to unlock a hidden mission. Permanently. Fuck that. <laughs> I'm not playing through the whole campaign a second time. I bought the game. Give me the missions. I paid for them, fuckface. Some of the individual missions themselves stood out. The Russian Embassy mission was quite good fun, although the abundance of conveniently placed empty cabinets for hiding bodies was vaguely hilarious. If I was head of security, I would wire up a flashbang booby trap in every single empty stationary cupboard in that embassy and catch all the Western imperialist scumbag infiltrators. Then again, if I was head of security at the Russian embassy, I wouldn't let fellas with American accents into the building if they were dressed as Russian army officers. But that's just me. I'm paranoid about that kind of thing. And maybe this mission sums up the point I was trying to make about puzzles in Call of Duty games. The Embassy mission was puzzle solving done right. The mission board? Well, not so much. Then again, plenty of people are enjoying that part of the game, so maybe it's just me being a bitch. The final part of the Embassy mission where you armour up and rock the LMGs, well, as fun as it was, perhaps best sums up the campaign compared to previous iterations of the franchise. It was clearly trying to reclaim the glory days and homage the Modern Warfare 2 level, no Russia. But instead of a shootout in an entire airport, we got about two corridors and a cutscene and about 50 feet in a fucking Trabant. Kinda low budget homage really. Low budget and with no moral controversy weak, in my humble opinion. Overall though, I have to give Raven Software some credit on the campaign. It's a bit botched, it's a bit of a mess in some parts, it's a bit pointless and a little bit boring. However, they tried to do something different, giving it multiple endings, add some player agency, organise the thing around the principles of a player driven investigation, and whilst they didn't quite Pull it off with finesse. Any attempt to innovate in this stale and play safe industry should be rewarded and congratulated. So yeah, it didn't quite go to plan, but I did like the plan and I'm glad I experienced it and I'm glad I played it all the way through. So what about the dreaded multiplayer? Food for thought. I'm really enjoying the multiplayer because of the new progressive score streak system which doesn't reset when you die, I'm actually getting to use score streaks. I have a positive KD, I'm not last on the scoreboard 100% of the time which is frankly a fucking miracle. Not even joking, I'm usually lowest score in every multiplayer match in previous Call of Duty games. Not even kidding. And for all the reasons listed above, Houston we have a problem. There are few immutable laws in the universe, but one is that 21 kiloton always comes last in Call of Duty and can't play for shit. I'm sorry, but this is a Twitch reflex shooter where being older than 11 means it's time to start planning your retirement from pro COD esports. So what the actual fuck is going on here? In some of these matches, I have actually come top which is impossible. Here is my hot take. I think Activision has taken a long hard look at the demographic of its players, more specifically the players who are time poor and have disposable income, and realised that catering for their 25 to 45 year old demographic is going to make them a fuck ton more cash than tuning the game for high skill cap 12 year olds who have to steal their mum's credit card if they want to buy so much as a gun skin. What's more, I am completely being serious. The combination of performance based matchmaking, progress based score streaks, so if you die you don't lose your progress, easy access to skill traps, 
<coughs> proximity mines, and the abundance of ammo and uh, grenades, <coughs> grenade spam, means this game has become a skillless fuckbobs camping paradise. Although I would exercise some caution, when the seasons and microtransactions launch, I reckon anyone with a history of spending money in the Activision shop is suddenly going to have a very, very bad day. I think they will fleece you in matchmaking and punish you until you spend money again. So everybody needs to be mindful of that. I think that when the monetization goes live and season one starts, players will suddenly start experiencing all sorts of manipulative shenanigans, much of which will be below a threshold where you'll be able to scientifically prove it, but it will nevertheless entirely manipulate your experience and progress. Players will most likely find themselves having long strings of good luck, right up until they hit time-gated content, or when they get close to capping something important or desirable on the season pass progress. And then they will start to hit a wall. I think players will be manipulated into being frustrated enough to just say, fuck it and buy the item with cash. Conversely, I think people will be subliminally rewarded after making a purchase by getting a sudden run of more sympathetic matchmaking for a short period of time to reinforce that unconscious mental association between spending and success. Activision has all the power here and there is no transparency or accountability. With the seasons, you have time-gated content which you grind out against the clock or simply pay for instead, and Activision gets to decide whether we go into lobbies entirely populated by sweaty try-hard killers or skillless fucks like me. And if you get identified as either a whale or a potential whale, e.g. a big spender, the AI algorithm will go to town on you and drill down into your game experience as hard as it can to constantly push you towards spending cash money to solve your progress problems. To some, this might sound like a conspiracy theory or science fiction, but since Activision registers patents for all of this crap, it's certainly very real technology for them. Incidentally, this game has in-game voice comms. I can't testify to the reliability of the voice comms in-game. I always have it switched off, all of the time. Otherwise, I just hear people screaming abuse at me all the way through the game for camping, using skill traps, and generally being a skillless camping fuck. The chat function did not work at launch. They're claiming this was an accident, but I'm actually suspicious as this is possibly the easiest and most well-practiced part of the game's development. My honest take is that something else was going on here. Given their past history of abusive chat filters, I think something went wrong with that, and they were having emergency meetings about how to proceed, and in the end just decided to switch chat off until they'd sorted it all out. I'm sorry, but I just can't believe that Call of Duty can't get the chat box working. The gun balancing at launch is beyond a joke. The MP5 submachine gun is so overpowered that it technically qualifies as the best assault rifle in game as well, pounding people into the dust at long distances. The M60, even lying down, has more wild uncontrollable recoil than this SMG fired from the hip. Some guns are death machines, some are practically unusable. Some of these issues have been addressed possibly in the first patch, but to be honest, it's all still on the wonk. At long range, I should not be out-traded by some dude in the open shooting a pop gun, but pop guns right now rule the roost. I would also note that something is not quite right with hit registration and synchronization. It would appear that the chicken dance has spread to Call of Duty. I've encountered a few jiggling ultra-high-speed fucks zipping around the map and couldn't register a hit on them. Not one hit. And it might be cheating, sure, but either way, it's pretty shady. Generally though, the multiplayer is what COD multiplayer usually is. 
It's a Skinner Box exercise in grinding out weapon mods and skins, which you rinse and repeat until you're bleeding from the ears. The only difference here is that there are not a lot of maps, very few weapons, and it frankly feels like the game is in a holding position. It's cruising in the slow lane until December comes, Season 1 microtransactions arrive, and then, then they will stamp on the gas. I would however note that there is a lot more options in multiplayer now. You have great selection filters for defining your searches for which type of matches you want to play. You have the standard stable of multiplayer matches and modes. You have zombies. You have combined arms, which seems to be a bit like ground war with vehicles. You know, a battlefield vehicle map mode from back before the Battlefield franchise turned to rat shit. It's big maps, more vehicles, more camping, and generally good for lazy folk like me. You have Warzone, which I guess is PUBG, which seems to be carrying over into Cold War Black Ops, and now exists as a separate entity running parallel with the yearly Call of Duty releases. If I got some of this wrong, I apologise. I'm pretty much a vanilla PvPer in Call of Duty. I do my small fast matches, and then go to bed with a porno and some Twinkies. I don't like Warzone, because I always die in the first minute, and to be honest, I've been hammering Normie multiplayer because it's mindless, pointless fun. The important thing here is, whatever type of PvP you are looking for, chances are that Call of Duty now has a game mode, map type or game type that suits you. It's clear here that they want to be the market leader in all three areas of combat PvP. Call of Duty, Battlefield, PUBG, they want to dominate the whole online multiplayer spectrum. So what are 21 kilotons top tips for surviving multiplayer? As always, the trusty trifecta of skill traps, rocket launcher, and some rando weapon that pisses bullets roughly in one direction, which doesn't require much reloading, is the natural choice for the fail cases, skill fucks and idiots like myself. Personally, I found the stock M60 utterly horrible. It's practically impossible to use, so naturally I decided it was my personal mission to master it. I eventually realised the best way to kit it out was this. Lots of bullets, a laser for hip fire, a high damage barrel, and absolutely nothing to control recoil or accuracy. Now here is my logic. If you're watching my videos and following my advice, then clearly you are as bad at aiming as me. Logically it follows that if you are bad at aiming, when you point your gun towards your intended target, it's not going to be aiming directly at it. Ergo, the more inaccurate your gun is, and the more it bounces around uncontrollably, the higher the probability that eventually the random scatter of shots of bullets might strike the target which you didn't correctly manage to aim at. Having the biggest possible magazine really helps with this process. No, really think about it, there's some cunning logic going on here. I generally, as a rule, always will pick the second best weapon in any class at the launch of a video game because the devs will usually start to suck their thumb after a few weeks, after having previously had it wedged up their asses, and then nerf the best gun in every class, because reasons. So yeah, don't fall in love with the best gun in any category, because at some point it's probably going to get fucked. Wallbang. Want to impress people with your Call of Duty skills? Well that ship has clearly fucking sailed, so instead annoy the piss out of them. Every time you're on the map Berlin, load up with an LMG with a big magazine and just lie down on the plane and mag dump through the thin walls. Just keep tapping off single rounds until you get a hit marker and then just mag dump everything you have, while spamming flashbangs and cooked off grenades. Following from this on domination, there are well-known and learnable sneaky corners where people hide whilst capping the flag. Learn where they are, so you can wallbang people hiding there. It might not be the most efficient way to get kills, 
but it's a guaranteed way to get some sweaty tryhard to burst some blood vessels in their eyes when you completely ass plunder their KD. Seriously, I've seen people quit out of the match because of this. So which weapon is best? Well I took this to 21 kilotons fucking science lab and analysed all the statistics for every weapon in every class. The best SMG is the MP5. The best assault rifle right now is the MP5, which is interesting because frankly it's also the best LMG and sniper rifle. Seriously, I don't care what your fucking question is because the answer is always the MP5. Best gun in any situation, in any class, which will outgun any other weapon at any range. Not even kidding. There must be some huge nerfs incoming, because someone clearly didn't test this out before launch. It's God's fucking ray gun, and it will smite you instantly from across the map. Reduce all your graphical settings. They say that your reflexes slow down significantly after you hit 15 years of age. My reflexes are so slow these days, when I see an enemy target, I could quite easily go for a shit and make a sandwich before coming back to pull the trigger and I doubt it would even affect my score that much. I need every advantage I can get. Do the following equation. Your age minus 15 equals how many graphic settings you need to turn down to speed up your PC's processing time, compensating for your slowness, thus giving you the edge in game. I set up my PC so it practically looks like fucking voxels and I found that it gave me about 500 milliseconds head start so I only get outgunned 98% of the time. Seriously, everything running on your PC slows down your processing time ergo your response time in game so do yourself a favour, don't run other programs at the same time or download porn in the background too much. Maybe even consider taking that shit after pulling the trigger from now on. I guess it's time to wrap up this shit show so you can get back to playing Call of Duty. What can I say really? It's it's a Call of Duty game, but a little bit worse than usual. It's got a mediocre campaign, but it's interesting enough. It's got decent PvP, albeit catering for filthy casuals and fail bobs like me. And after about a month it will start shitting microtransactions down your throat like a sadistic farmer fattening up a duck for Christmas. You know what it is, it's this year's Call of Duty. You will largely get what you pay for, it will keep you busy all year with mindless PvP action, you just need to keep reminding yourself that an entire army of psychologists and gambling experts will be working day and night to part you from your money. If you can keep your credit card in your pocket, as always, Call of Duty, whatever the fuck it's called this year, is a safe bet, albeit a slightly worse iteration than last year, and even that is down to personal taste. The main conclusions I reached about this game were this. 1. It's a decent enough video game. 2. It won't be remembered as one of the better Call of Duty titles. 3. It's basically entirely designed around the principles of separating the player from their cash. But if you're looking for a way to relax every evening by spending 20 to 30 minutes having some prepubescent sweaty no-lifer destroy you repeatedly to the point where you start screaming at the monitor and smashing your keyboard, then Call of Duty, as always, is perfect for the job. Even if that job is proving to you that you don't have the skills to be a professional esports competitor and probably didn't even when you were 12. But for now, good luck and happy hunting.